we might call it the social compact, or we might call it polite society. But over time, many of these notions, some would say are consolidated, others would say are co-opted uh, into religions, organized or otherwise. Oops. And ultimately, the, the religion, the morality, the social ethics become the basis for law. Not all of those tenets are adopted into law, but that's how law comes about. And in my, as my students referred to it, the Venn diagram from hell, legal ethics emerges <coughs> out of morality, religion, social ethics. It contains parts of all of that. And for the most part, it is law. Now, I have fluctuated back and forth as to whether legal ethics should be contained totally in the law circle, or whether some of legal ethics should be outside of the law circle, but still contained within the um, morality, religion, social ethics circles. And for the most part, um, at this point, I'm continuing to leave it in the law circle because, at least from the United States perspective, a lawyer can be disciplined for anything that the lawyer does, regardless of whether it is in connection with the lawyer's practice of law. So from that perspective, everything relating to legal ethics is law for the lawyer's point of view. Now, we've already had our quick overview of the ABA's history of adoption of the rules of conduct from the canons to the code to the rules. And the original canons going back to the origin story, um, if you want to do a Joseph Campbell mythology uh, uh, start, um, it goes back to 1854 and George Sharwood's uh, essay on professional ethics and the subsequent adoption of Alabama's code of ethics in 1887. Um, and these canons are said to have reflecting, to be reflecting values appropriate to a small town where easily adaptable to an equally homogeneous upper class metropolitan constituency where they served as a club against lawyers whose clients who, who were excludable from that culture, especially the urban poor, new immigrants, and blue collar workers. In essence, the original canons were adopted by the old boys club uh, to protect the old boys club. But Sorry. When we moved on uh, to the code and the rules, uh, thinking that we were progressing, uh, Jeff Hazard, who was a reporter to the commission, noted that the content of the legal profession's narrative and core ethical rules, as pronounced in the 1908 canons, the first canons, has been preserved largely unchanged in today's model rules. And what are those core values? Well, uh, they're defined uh, by popular consensus as loyalty, meaning loyalty to the client, confidentiality, <coughs> meaning confidentiality as Dean Ramirez spoke earlier uh, to the client and the client's objectives, and candor to the court, meaning we are all officers of the court as lawyers, we are part of the judicial branch. Now, some have defined it in different ways. See, in law school, they don't you know, it's all theories and lofty notions and big fat ethics books. What's wrong with ethics? Nothing, I guess. 
I mean, I believe the lawyer should fight for his client, refrain from stealing money, and try not to lie. You know, the basics. That's <laughs> what the ambulance chase him. Right. Who cares? There's a lot of lawyers out there. It's a marketplace. It's a competition. But they don't teach you in law school to get you hurt. So that's another way of stating what the core values of the profession are. You know, you should fight for your client, refrain from stealing money, and try not to lie. There's really not that much difference from the other core values that we're stating. Um, now, uh, Dean Ramirez earlier mentioned John Dean's handwritten note of the, uh, all the lawyers that were involved in Watergate. This is the handwritten note to which he was referring with all of the attorneys' asterisks, uh, with asterisks by their name. And who would know, who could ever imagine that legal professionalism was Richard Nixon's most unexpected legacy to America because as Dean Ramirez noted, it was Watergate that was the watershed uh, issue, watershed event that prompted the development of legal ethics and professionalism. But when I talk about my circle of legal ethics, there's really subparts to it as well. Legal ethics encompasses not just the individual lawyer's legal ethics, but it includes lawyer discipline. And at its core are the ABA model rules of professional conduct, which we talked about earlier. And the parallel development that was going on both before and particularly after Watergate was the development of lawyer discipline and the professionalization of lawyer discipline. Uh, one of the other ABA committees that was developed and was ongoing both uh, as a result of and during Watergate was the fact that lawyer discipline was still an old boys network uh, up to the 70s. Uh, as you see, the Clark Commission, uh, chaired by former Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark, reviewed lawyer discipline in the United States and discovered that it was practically non-existent. It was uh, uh, engaged in, it was supervised by the bar associations and rarely, uh, except in the most egregious cases, were there uh, actual uh, sanctions entered against lawyers who had engaged in misconduct. This led to the ABA developing standards for lawyer discipline and disability proceedings in 79, model rules for lawyer disciplinary enforcement in 89 and 93, and the development of alternatives to discipline, which largely addressed issues of substance abuse, mental illness, and the ability to uh, rehabilitate lawyers who may have practice problems uh, in uh, 1996. Uh, so when we talk about legal ethics and the development of legal ethics and morals and legal ethics, uh, we really have to include in that discussion the parallel, which is an effective lawyer disciplinary system. Um, and when we're talking about lawyer discipline, we're not just talking about the model rules of conduct. When we talk about the tension that exists within the model rules, we're talking about not only the uh, black letter rules that say you must do something or not do something, but we also have um, matters that disciplinary agencies, who are usually a component of the state Supreme Courts, have to discipline attorneys for matters that may not be covered by the rules of conduct. For example, in Illinois, the disciplinary authority can uh, uh, investigate and can uh, discipline an attorney for conduct uh, or for a matter whose conduct tends to defeat the administration of justice or to bring the courts or the legal profession in disrepute. That is a pretty broad mandate and it is used 
in almost every disciplinary case that is brought. The uh, disciplinary agency may cite uh, rules, uh, may cite uh, specific conduct as it applies to rules, and they always have the catch-all of and the conduct brought the administration of justice into uh, disrepute. Um, it's not something that is necessarily favored by lawyers uh, because it is so ambiguous, uh, but it is nonetheless there and it protects uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, because it allows the disciplinary agency to bring in matters uh, and to not have to find a specific rule for conduct uh, that uh, is going to embarrass the court or damage the public. And part of the internal tension is that there are also matters within the model rules that are not uh, frequently subject of discipline. Uh, we saw earlier some real examples of confidentiality <coughs> rules and situations. It is unlikely that any of those situations would ever result in discipline. Uh, rather, uh, when you look at the types of complaints that are made to disciplinary agencies, they are rarely things that result in discipline. Uh, most frequent complaints, and these are drawn from the most frequent uh, annual report, or the most recent annual report of the Illinois Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission, uh, failure of the lawyer to communicate with the client. Uh, and that can range from real failure to communicate or a disgruntled client who didn't get their phone call returned fast enough. Um, the most frequent basis for discipline is fraudulent or deceptive activity. Uh, most frequent classification of charges docketed was neglect. 70% of the lawyers who are disciplined are sole practitioners which indicates a serious practice type of problem. And at the end of 2012 in Illinois, there were 89,000 attorneys, 6,400 investigations, 103 sanctions entered, and 145 cases pending. So you can see that in a grand sense, the number of actual disciplinary actions per capita is quite small. Now, as we talked about, many things are not handled in the disciplinary system. Disclosure of protected client information, conflict of interest, competence, incivility. Um, Rule 6.1, which has not been adopted by many states in the ABA model, uh, it talks about an attorney's obligation to perform pro bono services. You know, that's something that is unlikely to uh, ever be a mandatory requirement. And um, then there's the eternal bugaboo of advertising and solicitation, which I won't even touch that, uh, because that is a um, red herring and a uh, problem that goes from state to state and has more to do with uh, uh, lawyer protection and border protection than it has to do with anything else. But the issue of civility codes and professionalism codes uh, is somewhat of a red herring because they stand merely for attorneys trying to improve the profession and improve the conduct of attorneys and not so much a question of whether there should be greater discipline for uh, certain types of conduct, uh, whether there is insufficient public protection or client protection, but it's more of an issue of trying to improve how we all interact with each other and how we can make the profession more habitable and more uh, friendly and less stressful uh, to everyone. Uh, and that's where you get into the types of civility or professionalism rules uh, that we seek uh, to foster. Uh, that's where the aspirational elements come in. 
Well, that didn't work. Thank you. How close was I to 15 minutes? It was wonderful.